<laughs> okay, so this is muscle tissue, and we're going to start out with muscle tissue with um, basically some microanatomy, and we really want to know what's going on at the microscopic level, what's happening in the cell with the molecules. That's where all of muscle physiology happens. For these big, great, big, gross movements like muscle flexion, it all happens with what's happening with molecules inside of a muscle cell. Okay, so muscles perform various tasks. And each of them is basically due to what's happening at the level of the molecule. And the tasks that are performed are pretty much based off of the muscle cell characteristics. So one of the tasks is excitability. And what that means is muscles are really good at responding to stimuli. A second task is conductivity. And what conductivity is, is a response where the signal is moved to neighboring cells. So not only are cells excitable, muscle cells excitable and can respond to a signal, they can move that signal on to neighboring cells. The muscles also have the task of contractility. They can, tra can contract, which means they can shorten the total cell length. And if we can shorten, we probably also can return to pre-contraction length, which is the task that's known as extensibility. Extensibility, return to pre-contraction length. And then the last task that can be performed by a muscle cell is elasticity. And what that means is the cell can recoil and create tension. after it's been stretched. So at this microscopic level, excitability, conductivity, contractility, extensibility, elasticity, all play into the ability for the muscle to function as a muscle functions. And one of the major functions, or one of the major purposes for skeletal muscles, simply move the bones. I want to write down there. Are you almost done? Just need five. Okay, you're going to get half of it. <laughs> All 
right, so how are these five tasks, how are they actually accomplished? Why are they accomplished in the way that they're accomplished? And for skeletal muscle, which again, just sort of review here, it's the muscle that's attached to bones, and in some cases, other organs, but basically it induces movement. That particular tissue, which you have a histological section here that we're now looking at, can contract and be excited and conduct and extend and, and exhibits elasticity because of the microscopic anatomy that exists. So here we are, we're basically looking at the level of the cell. This right here, this is an individual muscle cell. Here is a second muscle cell. Here's part of a third muscle cell. Here's part of a fourth muscle cell. And you can actually see a small bit of a fifth muscle cell there. Okay? So, individual muscle cell. This guy right here. Let's just take a look at this guy right here. What are the things that we actually see, that we actually see in this picture? Do you see a bunch of vertical lines? Okay? Your eyes are pointing tricks on you. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, those vertical lines are called striations. So skeletal muscle appears striated. Basically, they exhibit light and dark lines. Eventually, we're going to find out that those light and dark lines are what actually induce muscle contraction. Those are organized molecules, organized proteins within the skeletal muscle cell that when stimulated correctly are going to induce shortening of the muscle. So skeletal muscles attached to bones, it appears striated, it's under voluntary control, so movement is voluntary. It's under our control. If I want to walk over there, I can walk over there. If I want to walk over there, I can walk over there. If I want to make my heart beat, though. <laughs> I don't think I was really doing anything. If the muscle is in under involuntary control, anyone know what we would call that? Nice. <laughs> Autonomic, so it would be controlled by the autonomic nervous system. And most of these involuntarily controlled muscles are not attached to bone. And so it includes things like the heart, the muscle of the heart, the cardiac muscle. Muscle that we find in the digestive system, and in the vasculature, and the reproductive system, the urinary system. That contracts and opens up lumens and, and passageways within those organs. So now we know that skeletal muscle is attached to bones, it appears striated, it's under voluntary control. How about typical cell? What does the typical cell look like for skeletal muscle? So the typical cell size or average cell size is on the order of 100 micrometers in thickness. How big is a micrometer? <laughs> Thousands of a millimeter. One millionth of a meter. So you have a million micrometers 
in one meter. You have a thousand micrometers in a millimeter. So an individual muscle cell at 100 micrometers in thickness, you could lay 10 of them next to each other to fill up one millimeter on the metric ruler. One millimeter. See, I am so huge that I'm just getting it. Just laugh at that. Uh, you'll, yeah. you'll, you'll get it in a few, a few days. <laughs> What about length? Average length, about three centimeters in length, three centimeters long. Now, obviously, this is going to change. This is going to be altered due to <coughs> contraction and relaxation. It's contracted, going to be smaller, relaxed, going to be longer. So, average is about three centimeters in length. So, this is the average size of a muscle cell. Changes. Changes due to contraction or relaxation. How about a long? What are we talking about for long? Where would a long muscle be? A long muscle cell. Yeah. Rectus femoris is going to have some pretty long muscles, muscle cells. They may be thicker, up to 500 micrometers thick. So that's basically two muscle cells in a millimeter. And on the long side, they can be up to 30 centimeters in length. Now, individual skeletal muscle cells are going to be frequently called either muscle fibers or myofibers. So muscle cell, muscle fiber, and myofiber are all synonyms. Okay, so myofiber, skeletal muscle cell. This would be an individual myofiber. So let's take a look at individual myofiber. This is a three-dimensional representation of a myofibril. Notice that we have our endomesium. We've already identified that. Just below the endomesium is this thing called the sarcolemma. Anyone happen to know what else would be called the sarcolemma? <laughs> <laughs> what? Um, ground substance would be endomesium. But you're actually, you're kind of thinking in the right direction. I think you are at least. Now you're thinking in the wrong direction. Now you're thinking in, no. What surrounds the cell? Membrane. Cell membrane. Circle them is just simply the specific muscle or a uh, specific name for the muscle cell membrane. So plasma membrane, phospholipid bilayer, which is called sarcolemma. So notice that right below this connective tissue called the endomesium, we have the plasma membrane, the cell membrane, called the sarcolemma. Okay, so we have that connective tissue layer called the endomesium. And then just below that, we have our plasma membrane. Which we're going to call the sarcolemma. Now, one of the unique things about the sarcolemma, so here's my sarcolemma, my phospholipid bilayer. Notice that there are these, I'm going to call them invaginations. They basically are tubes, tube-like structures that permeate into the muscle cell. 
Now, if you were to magic school bus this bad boy, and you were to go down that hole there, what you would find is you'd still be an extracellular fluid. So the plasma membrane basically just, if we were to take a cross section through this small little area here, it would look something like that, where this is muscle, intercellular fluid, extracellular fluid is out here and permeates deep into the muscle itself. Okay? That structure, where you have that invagination into the uh, muscle cell itself, tubular invagination is going to be referred to as a transverse or T tubule. So transverse tubule or simply a T tubule. And it just simply allows that extracellular fluid to permeate deep into the muscle fiber, the myofiber. So it's opening to the extracellular fluid allows deep exposure of extracellular fluid into the muscle. So that's what you can see here, kind of in this yellowish color. You can see that this goes very deep inside of the inner workings of the muscle cell. All right, the internal space of this particular cell. Anyone remember these terms? What do you call the internal space of a cell? What do you call the internal solution? Okay, intracellular fluid, what's another name? Cytosol. And what if we're talking about the space? Cytoplasm. Okay, so the internal space of a muscle cell or its cytoplasm is going to be referred to as the sarcoplasm. So we have the sarcolemma, which is the membrane, and now the sarcoplasm, which is the internal space. Now, the sarcoplasm is going to actually be loaded up with a variety of organelles. And there are actually some very uniquely designed organelle or uniquely produced organelle within the cell. One of the organelles that shows up in sort of a surprising way is the nucleus. The nucleus of the cell, which you can see in this picture, two different examples of nuclei. Here's one here, and here's one here. That means that in this particular section of this muscle, there's, or this cell rather, there are two nuclei. That's weird, right? Why is that weird? Cells usually have a single nuclei. So muscle cells are going to be multinucleated. Furthermore, the multinucleated cells, the individual nuclei are pushed out towards the, uh, the uh, edge of the muscle cell. So up here underneath the sarcolemma. There aren't, any, any, there aren't any nuclei here towards the middle. They're all pushed out towards the membrane. Now, the reason that the cells are multinucleated is because when muscle cells develop through embryogenesis, we have multiple stem cells. So these are going to be cells that arise from the mesenchyme, which is that primordial embryonic tissue. They form individual mesenchymal cells, each having their own nucleus then they begin to fuse together. So multiple stem cells, which are referred to as myoblasts, are going to begin to fuse together to form one myofiber. And so the nucleus gets left over. But it actually turns out to be a pretty good advantage because the nucleus houses the genetic material. The genetic material is the information to generate proteins. Muscle cells are packed full of proteins. So by having multiple nuclei, we have multiple points of information storage for all of these proteins that we need to maintain 
in our muscle cells. Now, notice that we have a whole bunch of stuff packed away inside of the sarcoplasm in addition to multiple nuclei. This is where things maybe get a little bit more confusing if you don't keep up on the terminology. What is a whole muscle, muscle fiber called? What's another name? Myo fiber, right, right? So we have myofiber, which refers to the whole muscle cell. But packed in there, you have these structures here. These are organized proteins. And really, the most two common proteins in there are going to be actin and myosin. Each of these forms a small little thread-like structure. Those are referred to as myofibrils. Okay, so keep in your mind, What's the name of a muscle cell? What's the name of the protein structure packed into a myofiber? Myofibrils. So these myofibrils are going to be specialized structure of the myofiber. They are cords of protein. And if we were to go and measure the diameter of each of these myofibrils, they're going to be about one micrometer in diameter. Okay? What is it you're using? <laughs> yes, there's a lot of protein. <laughs> <laughs> Cords of protein. Oh man, I really like that. That would be a great name for a movie. We are the lords of protein. We make the muscles work. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty late right now, isn't it? <laughs> okay, so cords of protein, each of those cords of protein or myofibrils are about one micrometer in diameter. Let me get one more point in here and then uh, I'll give you a cliffhanger. So obviously we have intracellular fluid or what we would call cytosol. The cytosol or intracellular fluid of a muscle cell of a myofiber that intracellular fluid, fluid is going to contain several macromolecules that are required for muscle function. There are two in particular that I want you to be familiar with. The first one is going to be myoglobin. Myoglobin is actually going to be a oxygen storage protein. You have a small amount of oxygen that is going to be contained within myoglobin in the muscle so that you have an immediate oxygen supply during any sort of energy production. You're all familiar with the molecule hemoglobin. Hemoglobin has four globulin chains, two alpha globulins and two beta globulins, and each of those globulins holds up to one oxygen. If you take just a single globulin from hemoglobin, that basically is what you get from myoglobin. Okay, so it's in effect myoglobin is just one portion of the hemoglobin. It, they're not the same molecules. It's not like I can take four myoglobins and put them together and get a hemoglobin. But that's basically the same effect here. It's a globular protein that holds on to an oxygen. When you need an immediate oxygen supply, it's right there. You're going to deplete it almost immediately. Like, like for exercise? Yeah, exercise or response to stress or disease. If you need oxygen, you have a quick, immediate supply. But then you have to breathe in to recover what's been lost. Okay, so myoglobin is going to be present just as the oxygen storage. It's a very small amount of storage. We're going to have a molecule that stores the other component required for energy. Anyone know what that happens to be? To be? What's the other? Glucose. And how do we store glucose? I heard it. Glycogen. 
So we're also going to have glycogen, which is branch chains of individual glucose molecules all kind of stored up together so that we also have an immediate supply of glucose when we need it. So my cliffhanger is we're going to discuss this part of the picture down here. This is actually a graphical representation of what the mitochondria look like inside of the muscle cell. If you want to do a little bit of pre-reading before you come for next Monday, one of the things I'd suggest you take a look at is something called the endosymbiotic theory. The endosymbiotic theory, just really in brief as you're packing up here, is basically the theory that at one time you had a small bacteria-like organism that invaded a much larger organism, and that eventually became the mitochondria that we find today. This has been used as huge support for evolutionary theory. However, I stand here convinced that the mitochondria and the diversity that we now understand mitochondria come in in a variety of other tissues, including muscle, sort of puts an end to the endosymbiotic theory. You're not going to hear that in secular institutions, though. They still readily teach endosymbiotic theory as proof of evolution over universities in Georgia, Piedmont College, and they actually are falling behind on science. So we'll pick up with that on Monday. What was the theory? Endosymbiotic theory.